Good day, everyone. Welcome, and uh, thanks for joining us for another great session of Data Center Insights from Intel. My name is Katie, and uh, before we dive into today's awesome webinar, I would like to point out a few features of the Bright Talk tool for you. There is a Questions tab at the top of the viewer. I encourage you to please ask questions at any time. Our presenter will answer them for you at the end of the presentation. And also at the end of today's webinar, you will be prompted to rate the presentation. Please feel free to take the time to provide feedback. We really value your thoughts, and we'll use this feedback um, to help improve our webinars moving forward. If we don't get a chance to answer your question, have no fear. Uh, we do look at questions on our Twitter handle at Intel IT Center. You can present them there to us after the webinar. There is also an Attachments tab where you can find supporting documents for today's presentation. You will also find a link there to uh, last month's Deep Learning 101 presentation from Senior Technical Lead of Deep Learning, Andres Rodriguez. I encourage you to check that out. Uh, you can visit this section after today's webinar. Uh, we'll make sure to upload some really great resources for you there. So today's webinar episode is entitled Deep Learning. Neural Network Architectures and Algorithms. We have our wonderful presenter, Anthony Durango. He is our staff data scientist of deep learning solutions here at Intel. So today, Anthony will take us inside the world of deep neural networks and their use to deploying successful deep learning solutions. In this webinar, Anthony will be sharing insights and examples of of the different neural network architectures and algorithms. It's great to have all of you here today. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and hand things over to Anthony. Okay, thank you. So uh, today's presentation uh, will cover the basic ideas that go into building an end-to-end -end speech recognition system that's trained entirely using deep learning techniques. So our main focus will be on a specific use case of uh, applied deep neural network techniques. Uh, we will avoid getting too technical, hoping instead to convey an application, or an appreciation I should say, of the high level concepts that go into training a speech recognition engine in an end-to-end -end fashion. I will assume that the audience has a basic familiarity with the core primitives used in deep learning. So for example, I will assume that you have heard of things like learning via gradient descent, convolution operations, and uh, neural networks with multiple layers. And uh, if you don't have that much background in any of these areas, we will be providing uh, additional resources uh, at the end of the presentation, and some of these resources are, are actually already available as part of this webinar series. Okay, so what exactly is deep learning? So uh, without getting too uh, technical, uh, deep learning refers to a powerful set of techniques for training neural networks. And the key selling points are that these networks learn directly from data and that their performance improves as you scale up the size of the models and the amount of training data. So those are the two key things to keep in mind. So as long as you have a lot of training data, and as long as you have enough computational power to process the data, then uh, deep learning techniques will probably apply to the domain that you're interested in. And the really interesting thing about deep learning is that we no longer have to rely on human engineers to handcraft features in order to solve complex problems. And in some cases, doing away with designing features can save years of time in research and development. And uh, so deep learning success stories uh, span several problem domains today. Uh, these include uh, image recognition, speech recognition, natural language processing, and reinforcement learning. And uh, here's a sample of examples where the Intel Nirvana platform has been applied to real world problems. These include things like detecting tumors, counting plants in agricultural robotics, finding oil-rich regions in uh, seismic data, uh, building better speech interfaces in cars, searching through financial time series, 
and analyzing sequences of amino acids. Uh, one remarkable fact about these solutions is that they were crafted by brilliant Nirvana engineers who did not necessarily start out with the main expertise in this uh, particular area. And this was certainly true for me when I started working on speech recognition about a year ago. So essentially, the other thing that we should take away from this is that deep learning is sort of democratizes machine learning and allows people who don't necessarily have uh, domain expertise in an area to actually make meaningful contributions. And uh, deep learning as well has made, has achieved state-of-the-art performance on several perceptual tasks. And in some cases, like recognizing images or recognizing speech, these performance gains have been so remarkable to a point where they, are, they begin to become competitive with humans on some of these tasks. Now, turning now to speech recognition proper, the basic idea, well, the basic problem in speech recognition is to convert a spoken utterance into a text transcript. So for example, in the figure shown on the slide, you're given a waveform, a raw waveform, raw waveform and this raw waveform contains an utterance, and the job of the speech engine is to extract the text transcript of that utterance. So for example, in the case shown, the text transcript would be something like 20,000 leagues under the sea. And the problems that we deal with uh, have, so the use cases that we normally encounter involve uh, sy uh, systems that have to, have to learn vocabularies that have on the order of 10,000 words. And the systems are also required to recognize complete sentences and or paragraphs. Uh, most of today's uh, voice search applications are powered by speech engines that are trained using a blend of deep learning techniques and other machine learning techniques. So these are known as hybrid deep neural network systems. Uh, these hybrid systems require a great deal of expertise on the part of the engineers that build them. Uh, schematically, these systems break up the problem into several key components as shown. The first stage takes the audio signal and extracts uh, spectral features from it. An example of this would be converting an audio waveform into a spectrogram. Uh, these spectral features are then fed into what is known as an acoustic model. And the job of the acoustic model is to learn the relationship between the features and the phonemes, where phonemes are defined as the at atomic distinct units that allow us to distinguish words. And a lot of the expertise that goes into building these um, speech recognition pipelines stems from the complications involved in passing from phonemes to words. So the remarkable thing here is that within the last couple of years, researchers at Baidu discovered that you can pretty much replace most of this complex pipeline with a pure deep neural network system. And what this actually in turn means is that a deep learning engineers with very little experience in or very little background in speech recognition, but who know quite a bit about how to train deep neural networks can actually begin experimenting with this kind of models and make meaningful, meaningful contributions to the field. So to build an acoustic model, we first need to know something about how to deal with sequential data because uh, speech data is naturally sequential. So uh, how, how would we go about dealing with uh, sequential information in data. So, so the naive way would be to start off with, a, with something like this. So you take your audio sequence and you chop it up into segments. And what you do is you just feed in each segment into a neural network. So you first apply a convolution filter, and then you feed the output of that through a stack of hidden layers. So in this case, we have two hidden layers and one convolution layer. So in the first segment, you do something like this, and then at the second time step, you imagine sliding it a few frames over and applying the same neural network to it, and then you keep doing that until you get to the end of the sequence. So the overall picture ends up looking something like this, and we call this the unrolled picture across time. So what you're really doing here is you're just independently feeding each segment of audio as an input, but what we really want is a model that coherently 
takes into account the temporal structure of the entire uh, input as a whole. So one way of doing this is to allow the model to develop a memory trace of inputs that it has seen previously. And the way we do this is we allow connections between units in the hidden layers. So this, these connections are known as recurrent connections. So you basically build in interlayer connections between the units, and this is actually equivalent to using the output of a given layer at a given time step, say at time t minus one, as an input to the same layer at a later time step t. And the overall network looks schematically as shown here. So for example, at time step two, in the second layer, the hidden, hidden, units, the hidden units in the second layer at time step two have two input sources. So one input source is from the layer directly below it at the same time step, and the other input comes from the left, which is coming from exactly the same layer but at a previous time step. So these networks are known as recurrent neural networks, and they are very, very good at dealing with uh, sequential data. So we stack up these recurrent neural networks, and our acoustic model ends up looking something like this. And the only difference here is that instead of using uh, the recurrent neural networks that we just saw, we use a variant of them known as bidirectional recurrent neural networks. And they are known as bidirectional recurrent neural networks because they, they process information in the sequence simultaneously, but in two directions in time. So essentially you have two back-to-back -back recurrent layers that look at the, sequ the sequence in opposite directions. And this is very useful in uh, speech recognition because a given phoneme or even a word at a specific time point may depend on which words have occurred previously as well as which words followed, which words occurred subsequent uh, time steps. So the context is very important when you're dealing with speech signals. Uh, so far, I haven't said anything about how we do the feature extraction stage, so how we go from the raw spectrogram, uh, from the raw audio form into a spectrogram, for example. And uh, the, the way we do this is we use uh, a library from Intel Nirvana named Eon, and uh, this library allows us to train directly from the audio file by extracting the spectral features on the fly. And in addition to allowing us to train directly from the raw audio, Eon also lets us augment the data on the fly. So for example, we can add arbitrary noise samples to our training data as we are training by just simply adding a single line of code to our training script. Now I should say that this is the one stage of the pipeline that will probably go away in future incarnations, uh, mainly because researchers have recently found that you can replace the spectral features and train the networks directly on raw audio waveforms by simply adding more convol convolution layers at the beginning of the network. And this, so this is something that uh, we believe will happen in the next uh, incarnations of these models. So the feature extraction stage will probably no longer be something that we have to be worried about. Nevertheless, uh, Aeon, the Aeon library allows us to deal with direct to deal directly with raw audio waveforms, so we can still use the, exactly the same data loader to process the audio. And uh, Aeon also supports um, image and video data, so if you are dealing with those domains, it is also a very useful tool to have. So building the entire model is actually very straightforward in NEON. So NEON is Intel Nirvana's uh, deep learning framework, and in NEON, the entire training script for the model uh, is about 50 lines of code, and we have open sourced the, uh, the implementation, and you can uh, find it on GitHub at the URL listed above. And the uh, other thing that we need to keep in mind is that when you are training these sort of models, uh, the, you require lots of computational resources, so the models are, are actually very large and require a lot of compute, and we'll cover this later. But essentially what this means is that if you're training these models, you need to keep in mind that uh, 
you will be doing a lot of compute, so you need to have the most efficient or the fastest uh, implementation out there. So when you're training the model, the gradients to train the model are derived from what is known as the CTC cost function, which we're going to get to in a second. But uh, we, so like any other uh, supervised, supervised learning framework, uh, you start off with an objective function, and you then take derivatives of the objective function to find the corrections to your gradients. And so the specific uh, objective function that we use is known as a CTC uh, cost function. And we train our models using a variant of stochastic gradient descent with momentum, known as Nesterov's accelerated stochastic gradient descent. And all the hyperparameters for our models are chosen empirically based on their performance on a validation set. So how do we actually train this, this model? In other words, how do we go from the objective function to find the kinds of adjustments that we need to make to the connections? So before we talk about the objective function, we first need to figure out what our, the outputs of our model look like. So the way this is set up is that in the final layer of the model, uh, we have a, a set of units, and we have as many units as there are uh, characters in the transcripts that we want to uh, map to. So each letter in the alphabet, say A through Z in English, is represented by a unique unit in the output layer of the model. And the output, the output, model, the output layer also contains two additional units. One unit represents the space character between words, and the other unit is reserved for a special character, usually known as a blank character. And this blank character is taken to represent things like pauses and other non-speech noises that, are, that may occur in the audio signal. So at any given instant, the output of any given unit in the final layer of the model is interpreted as the probability of, of observing that character, uh, the probability of observing the character represented by that unit. So for example, at an arbitrary time step, say time step 17, the output for the unit representing the letter A is interpreted as the probability that the letter A occurred in the audio signal at time step 17. What this means is that for each utterance that is presented as an input to the model, the model produce, produces a matrix of, of probabilities, and each column of this matrix is a distribution over the characters. So this is what we're trying to schematic, schematically show in the figure. So we pretend that we only have uh, an alphabet with the characters A, B, C, and then we include the blank character, and we feed, once, once we feed in an audio signal, the model outputs a matrix of probabilities such that in each column of this matrix, we can read off the probability of each of those characters. So that's, what, that's how we interpret the, the outputs that are coming out from our model. And this is what we need to be able to begin training the model. So the adjustable parameters of the model are modified by calculating gradients of what is known as the CTC cost function, which stands for connectionist temporal classification. So this function takes in two inputs, the output probability matrix from the model and the ground truth transcript of what is said in the address. And to define what the CTC function actually does, we first need to define what is, what is known as a collapse function. And this is best uh, demonstrated using an, using an example. So the way this works is given a string composed of characters and blank symbols, the collapse function first removes all consecutive repeated characters in the string, and then removes all blank symbols. So given the string shown in the, as the argument of the collapse function, which is composed of n's, e's, r's, and r, v's, a's, and, and another n, interspersed with uh, blank symbols, we first remove all repeated consecutive repeated characters, and then we remove all blank symbols, and so that particular string will collapse into nirvana. So this is what the CDC function uh, implicitly defines this function as a basis for its operation. So armed with, it, with this function, here's what the CTC algorithm does. So given an output probability matrix, 
from the model and a transcript taken from the training data, the CTC algorithm first finds all possible strings, which when fed through the collapse function, collapse onto the transcript. And then it uses the probability matrix to assign a weight to each of the strings. So let's look at an explicit example just to see what's going on. So uh, suppose that the audio input has five frames and the ground truth transcript is the word cap. So what the algorithm is going to do is find all strings of length five, including blanks, that collapse onto the word cap. So in this mm -hmm. case, there are essentially uh, 28 such strings, and these are enumerated in the table shown. And for, for this specific example, we imagine that we have the probability matrix shown in the middle of the figure. And we suppose that given the audio of five of the audio input of five frames, the model will produce a probability matrix with exactly five columns. So to compute the CTC cost for this example, the algorithm takes each string in the first table and reads off the corresponding character probabilities from the matrix as shown on the table on the right. So for example, we can read off the probabilities for the string blank blank C A B and multiply each probability that occurs in that string from the table and obtain a result. And we imagine going through all the strings, repeating this process for each string, and we finally add up all the results, and this defines the CTC cost function for that particular example. And so the key thing here is that since this CTC cost function is computed by simply multiplying and summing up probabilities, and since the value of each probability comes from an output of the model, then the entire function is differentiable, and we can use it as a starting point for gradient descent to train the model. So that's how we train these models. So once you've, you've trained the model, um, how do you test it? How do you evaluate it? So at the evaluation time, you don't necessarily have a ground truth transcript, so how would you figure out what the model is actually outputting? So to do this, you need to uh, implement what is known as, as a decoder. So once you've tested the model, you evaluate it by testing it on previously unseen utterances from the test set. And since the model outputs a probability matrix of the characters, you need to build a decoder to transform the model's output into actual word sequences. And the decoder's job is to search through the probability matrix that comes out as an output and generate the most probable sequence as a transcription. So the simplest approach is to do the following. So if you have the output And for each column, you just do an argmax. So for example, in the example shown here, the first column, doing an argmax would give us the blank character as the output. And we do that for each column. So the second column would give us a C for the argmax. The third column would give us an A for the argmax, and so on and so forth. So we end up with blank C, A, B, B as the output from that probability matrix. And we simply just then concatenate the characters together to obtain a string, and then feed the string through the collapse function and obtain the decoded output. So this is the simplest thing that you can do given a probability matrix and no other constraints. So if you, do, if you train an actual model on, say, about 100 hours of data, um, which we did using what is known as the Wall Street Journal corpus, corpus uh, you basically get a model that produces uh, outputs that look like this after being fed to the decoder. So it essentially makes what we call uh, phonetic spelling errors. So it, it spells out words phonetically. And we've, what we're actually highlighting here are the, pro, are the you know, examples of things that the model finds particularly difficult to deal with. So for the most part, it gets a lot of the examples right, but uh, on, it does make several mistakes, and most of these mistakes happen to be ha happen to be mistakes that have these phonetic spelling mistakes in them. So, for example, the word "united" uh, is spelled "united" in the first uh, example, and then the second example is a simple substitution of the letter "s" for the letter "c," and those are the kind of mistakes the model makes. And what we've actually observed is that many of these errors in the predictions only occur in words that 
do not appear in the training set. So if the test set has transcripts which contain words that do not appear in the actual training set, then the model tends to make these sort of phonetic spelling errors in the outputs. So you can imagine that by increasing the size of your training data set, you can elim eliminate many of these phonetic spelling errors. And uh, researchers at Baidu found it, that that is exactly true. So that by training on thousands of hours of data, you can dramatically reduce the uh, occurrence of these phonetic spelling errors. But you never can quite remove them all, mainly because the model is trained on characters, so it really has no sense of the, the rules of language in any explicit sense. So you can improve the model's uh, performance, which is measured in terms of word error rate, by allowing the decoder to incorporate uh, constraints from an external language model. And we do this using what are known as uh, weighted finite state transducers, or WFSTs for short. And essentially what you're really trying to do is you're trying to build the following two things into your decoder. So you're, you are f and trying to force your decoder to only produce words that are valid according to some predetermined dictionary. So any word that comes out of the model should exist in your dictionary. And the other thing you're trying to do is you're trying to uh, ensure that the decoder favors likely word sequences. So words that happen to occur together in many examples should be favored relative to other words. And you do this using what are known as bigrand and trigram language models. So why do we use uh, this uh, weighted finite state transdu transducer approach? So mainly because uh, the, these uh, WFSTs contain essentially the logic of exactly what we're trying to do. So we cannot hope to explain what WFSTs exactly are in the short time we have allotted, but we, c we should just think of a WFST as a type of a state machine where by state machine we mean any piece of hardware or software whose behavior can be described in terms of transition between states. So the WFSD, a WFSD is just a state machine whose state transitions map a sequence of input symbols to a sequence of output symbols where, for example, the input sequence could be sequences of characters and the output sequences could be sequences of words, which, words from a dictionary, which is exactly what we want. And so all the pieces needed to decode our model's output probability matrix uh, into words can be couched in terms of FSTs, and in particular, the CGC mechanism is easily represented as an FST, which in turn can be composed with uh, FSTs, lexicon FSTs, and grammar FSTs to construct a decoder. And we have, uh, thanks to decades of computer science research, there are many efficient algorithms and excellent libraries for composing, optimizing, optimizing and searching through these FSTs, and many of these were actually developed for speech recognition. And so in our implementation, we take advantage of several of these libraries to construct our decoder. Okay. And um, so what happens if you incorporate a, uh, the language, uh, external language model using uh, the WFSTs? So on the left, we have a list, the same listing of the uh, examples that the, problem, that the model struggled with where we were getting those phonetic spelling errors. And by simply including these external language model constraints, the model essentially produces exactly uh, what that match exactly onto the transcript. So you can essentially eliminate things like phonetic spelling errors, uh, be essentially because you're forcing the decoder to only output things that actually exist as words in your dictionary. So this is sort of expected, nothing surprising there. Um, and when you include these language model constraints, you really improve the word error rate dramatically. So the, the last row of the table shows results from our implementation. So without a language model, the word error rate is about 32.5%. And as soon as you include a language model, this lang this, uh, the word error rate drops to 8.4%. And uh, the numbers that we get from our implementation are competitive with what exists in the literature. So we included uh, examples of other end-to-end -end, uh, uh, models trained using purely deep learning techniques for comparison. 
and all of these models are trained on exactly the same data set. So you can actually make an apples to apples comparison of their performance. So before we uh, close, we should talk about or say something about the amount of compute required in training these models. So uh, the models that we deal with will typically have about 50 million adjustable parameters. And we can do a simple count of the number of floating point operations involved in doing a single training pass, say, through one hour of speech data. And if you just do the simple arithmetic, that number comes out to about 10 to the 14 floating point operations. Uh, in a typical use case, it takes about 20 training passes for the model to convert. So you need to go through the data set about 20 times for, it, for the model to actually converge and achieve uh, good performance. So if we imagine doing this for 1,000 hours of data, then our count gets us to 10 to the 18 floating point operations. So if you get your hands on the fastest GPU available in the market today, assuming full utilization, you can squeeze out, squeeze out about 10 teraflops out of the device. So uh, you divide 10 to the 18 by 10 to the 13, and that gives you about 10 to the 5 seconds or about two days. So if you assume, so this is essentially as fast as you can go, assuming no overhead and uh, you, you have full, GP, uh, full GPU utilization. Uh, in practice, you never get anywhere close to that, and the training time for about 1,000 hours is closer to a week. So you need about a week, slightly, slightly maybe seven, eight days to train on 1,000 hours of data on a single uh, GPU device. So uh, when you first begin experimenting with these models, um, waiting around for a week for your model to train is possible because you don't really know what the correct parameters or what range of parameters you need to choose when you start experimenting. So you sort of, you're, ex you're doing exploratory work and you need to iterate as fast as possible. So waiting around for a week is not acceptable. So there's two solutions to this. Uh, one of which we use today, which is to essentially scale up to multiple GPUs, um, so you can have up to eight GPU cards in a single box. And uh, we have a proprietary uh, solution at Intel Nirvana, which we call MGPU, that we use to train this model. So that, that's one way of cutting down the training time to something manageable. And the other obvious uh, solution is to throw more compute at the problem. So you need some sort of hardware accelerated uh, solution. And as you may have heard, uh, our Lakecrest deep learning chip comes out in 2017. And this will allow you to cut down the training time from uh, two days to under five hours on a single device. So the main takeaways here are that, uh, one, deep learning techniques are really democratizing uh, speech recognition technologies, among other domains. And secondly, that achieving state-of-the-art performance requires lots and lots of data, meaning thousands of, thousands of hours of data, and significant computational resources. So as I mentioned earlier, we, we are open sourcing our implementation at GitHub, and we encourage you to try your hand at building your own speech recognition engine. And at the, at the same time, you should also download, get your hands on Neon, which according to third-party benchmarks is currently the fastest deep learning framework out there. We also provide uh, pre-trained models in what we call the model zoo. So if you don't want to have to wait for a few days or a week training a model, you can simply download a pre-trained model as a starting point for your experiment. And we have models trained on many tasks, including object recognition, object detection, semantic segmentation, natural language processing, and speech recognition. So you can, whatever, whatever a sort of model you're interested in exploring, you can just download one of these pre-trained versions and cut your, uh, save yourself you know, some pain in exploring the model space and have a, sort of a warm start to begin the experiment. And you can learn much more about deep learning and its applications from the excellent tutorials and blog posts on the Intel, Intel Nirvana AI Academy website, as well as from Intel's Deep Learning 101 webinar and Intel's Artificial Intelligence website. So thank you.
Thanks so much, Anthony. And just a reminder to our audience that um, all of those resources that Anthony just mentioned at the end, um, we will be uploading to the attachment section after today's presentation. So check those out in about within the next hour. Um, and of course, with all this excellent information, we've had some really great questions come in. So I'd like to throw those your, your way, Anthony. Um, the first one we have asks, how much data does one need to train a state-of-the-art speech recognition engine? So um, uh, according to what has been published out there, the, you can get pretty good performance using a few hundred hours of data, but to get good generalization on uh, data from various uh, environments, you need to have on the order of thousands of hours of data. So um, I would say that having a few, uh, a few thousand hours of data is uh, a good starting point. Perfect. Okay, and then we have what would it take to put together a large enough data set to train a state-of-the-art system? So uh, the uh, publicly available data sets are limited in size. You can get your, your hands on about 1,500 hours of data from um, open source, uh, from essentially open source data. That will get you maybe 1,500 hours, maybe, maybe 2,000 hours if you uh, search hard enough. So meaning that most of the speech recognition, most, most of the data used to train speech recognition systems out there is proprietary, so you need to uh, spend some money um, uh, in order to um, get thousands of hours of data. So it's quite expensive uh, if you are an independent researcher. Okay, and uh, when the Intel deep learning hardware comes out using Nirvana Design, how long would it take? I'm not sure if that's I think something you have an answer to, but... <laughs> they, I think they probably mean how long it would take to train the system, or...? Yeah, uh, let's go down that path. <laughs> so, it, so essentially, uh, the projected uh, uh, speed up is a factor of 10, so whatever training time you have today, you just divide that by a factor of 10, and that's the number that you get. So if you're talking... Uh, so instead of training for a week, you train in uh, seven tenths of a week, which is uh, less than uh, a day. Got it. Thank you. And it uh, looks like we have one more question from the audience here. How does the model you described compare with state of the art hybrid DNN slash HM systems? So, uh, deep learning systems. Uh, trained on uh, thousands of hours of data. So the Baidu system was trained on over 12,000 hours of data. And those systems are competitive with the hybrid uh, DNN HMM system today, but on a, on, a, on, a, on a very specific task, which is uh, 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 essentially what we call red speech, which is an easier form of speech. So when it comes to uh, conversational speech, um, if you train on thousands of hours of data uh, using a deep neural network, you can also get competitive results with uh, DNN HMM hybrid systems. But if you insist on training on uh, data sets that are on the order of 1,000 hours, then the hybrid systems are still, still outperform the big, deep neural network model. Wonderful. Well, it looks like that wraps up our questions for today. Um, thanks so much for sharing your expertise and enlightening all of us on this fantastic subject, Anthony. Um, we really appreciate you taking the time to talk with us today. And to all our viewers, thank you. And we hope to see you in future episodes of Data Center Insights with Intel. If you haven't subscribed to our channel already, you can do so from the main Data Center Insights channel window. This way you can stay up to date and easily register to any of our upcoming webinars. 
So until next time, be well, and we hope you have a really great holiday season all.